So uh, now we have Frank Stegmaier, uh, no relation. And you may notice there's a polymorphism in their last names. So, so uh, Frank uh, grew up in Germany and uh, got his first degree at, at Tübingen. And then he came to MIT as a graduate student and he worked in Angelica Amon's lab on yeast. And after that, he went over the river to Harvard Medical School to Steve Elledge's lab for a postdoc. And subsequently, again, back across the river, and is now working at the Novartis Institutes in Cambridge, where he's a, uh, a program leader. And he's going to talk to us about using barcoding to study um, clonal aspects of tumors. Which, which is his computer? That one. OK. OK, Fred. Yeah, I'll start out with a little disclaimer. Actually, my uh, four-year-old, who's lovely, uh, just passed on a bug to me the last two days. So I'm fighting a sore throat, so I might uh, need to grab my water bottle along the way. Which one is? Uh... Yeah. So I, I would like to start out by uh, thanking Tyler and Mike for the invitation to speak here. Um, it's really been a, a great symposium so far, so I hope that I don't bring down the quality of the talks um, for the rest of the meeting. Um, I'll tell you today about studying clonal dynamics of resistance using high complexity barcoding. And this work was really led by an extremely talented postdoc in the group, Kerry Bung, who is now an investigator at Novartis. Given the topic of the symposium, I don't need to introduce the concept of cancer heterogeneity, as was nicely um, explained this morning by Charlie, um, which was a seminal paper shown here, as well as Alice, uh, Christine, and others. But I'll suffice to say that despite our increased appreciation of tumor heterogeneity, we're still currently lacking or have limited tools to study and track single cells in the course of tumor evolution, especially, um, let's say, in the course of cancer treatments. So for our work, we set out to develop a high-complexity barcoding system that would allow us to uh, quantitatively analyze both the clonal diversity and heterogeneity of these tumor cell populations. And the idea behind this was rather simple. We wanted to develop a high-complexity barcoding system that allows us to uniquely label each cell within the population with a unique sequence tag. And then after the um, treatment with different drugs, we can extract genomic DNA, amplify the, BCR, uh, the, the barcode sequences by, B, by uh, PCR, and then subject them to next generation sequencing. And we should get two kinds of information from this. First, the number of all unique barcodes should give us a representation of the clonal complexity of, of the tumors after treatment. Secondly, the relative abundance of each of the barcodes should reflect the relative um, proliferative fitness of the individual clones. So this barcode library, um, I'll only very briefly describe it, um, is the working piece is really a 30 base pair semi-random barcode sequence. And this was generated in lentiviral backbone that allows for transduction of a large variety of cell lines. We also included a, a fluorescent protein tag RFP so that we can apply the system easily to in vivo studies, which I'll not uh, discuss today. We confirmed that the barcode distribution in this library was very uniform, that on average we get about two to, see, two to seven sequences of each of the barcodes. And importantly, um, this, this library was of very high complexity, at least 20 million and up to 80 million unique barcodes. We named this library Clone Tracer because it allows the labeling of more than a million cells and allows us to then uh, trace the fate um, of, of these cells over, over time. Um, I should also point out, because many people after we published this work in Nature Medicine have requested the library, it's now available at AdGene um, to the academic community. So we wanted to use this library to address two important questions and long-standing questions in the field of drug resistance. First, how many cells are contributing to drug resistance? So what amount of the population is really driving resistance? Is it single clones, or is it actually a collection of clones? Secondly, I think an equally important, if, if not more interesting question is, and, and clinically important question, is, is the drug-resistant population pre-existing prior to treatment, or is it acquired in the course of treatment? And we thought that um, we could address this question nicely with the barcoding system, because if we perform multiple replicate experiments, we would um, expect that if the resistant clones are pre-existing, in each of the replicate experiments, the same barcode should be selected out. By contrast, if the uh, resistance were de novo acquired and we perform the replicate experiments, in each of the replicate experiments, we would then expect different barcoded cell populations to emerge. <clears throat> 
We applied the system to study um, the resistance to allotinib in non-small cell lung cancers, and I don't have to cover this slide because Alice pointed out this morning that allotinib has been approved for the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. And while it has very significant activity in this population, um, invariably patients relapse. So the understanding of these resistance mechanisms in non-small lung cell lung cancer are really important. So in order to study this, um, we use the HCCA27 non-small cell lung cancer model, which has an EGFR exon 19 deletion, which confers high sensitivity to allotinib. We infected these cells with a clone tracer library at a complexity of more than a million unique barcodes. And then after expansion of this population, we treat four replicates with DMSO as a control and eight independent replicates with two micromolar allotinib for 36 days. At the end of the experiment, we then harvest the, the, the cell populations, extract genomic DNA and PCR, and sequence the barcode sequences. And in contrast to the DMSO treatment control um, at, at the top, where we did not see any significant barcode enrichment, we saw a very strikingly different barcode uh, pattern after the allotinib treatment, where a subset of the barcodes was significantly enriched. So we now figured we can use this question to address uh, the question of what fraction of the population is actually driving resistance. By applying a threshold that was set based on the most enriched barcodes in the DMSO control treated population, we can basically just ask how many barcodes are enriched above that level in the allotment treated samples. And when we did this, for each of the eight independent replicates, we found that about 400 to 500 barcodes are significantly enriched. And it was quite remarkable that the number was uh, very uniform ac across the independent replicates, always between 400 and 500. We started out this experiment, as I mentioned earlier, with about 1 million uniquely barcoded cells. So now the fact that we recovered about 400 to 500 barcodes indicates that a very rare uh, or small fraction of the tumors uh, of this cell line, in this case 0.05%, drives the resistance to allotinib. We next wanted to um, address the question whether the barcodes in these replicate experiments are similar or different to, to address the questions of pre-existence. And the, the results were very striking. More than 50% of the barcodes in the eight replicate experiments were similar, were identical across all the eight independent experiments. Moreover, in more than nine, or close to 90% of the barcodes were observed in at least two out of the eight replicates. And I told you that given that a very small subpopulation, only 0.05% of the clones are driving resistance, even enrichment and overlap in two independent replicates is unlikely to happen by chance. So together these findings suggest, strongly suggest that the majority of resistance in this experiment was driven by a pre-existing um, population of resistant cells rather than de novo acquired mutations. A paper um, a few years ago by Jeff Engelman's group has very nicely shown um, that MET amplification can be a driver of resistance in the HCC A27 lung cancer model. And in the study, they actually used high throughput fish uh, to look at potential pre existence of MET amplification. And I don't envy the, the person who had uh, to look over 4,000 fish samples in order to identify the six uh, fish positive samples shown here, probably a graduate or undergraduate student. Um, who had to do this, um, but it did not escape our notion that the frequency of the uh, pre-existing metamplified cells, 0.14%, was remarkably similar to the 0.05% of barcode enrichment that we observed in our study. So this suggested that it may be met amplification also in our experiment that's really responsible for uh, the majority of the pre-existing resistant population. If this were the case, we would expect that treatment with a MET inhibitor, such as crinsotinib, should um, target these pre-existing resistant clones. And indeed, when we treated now the allotinib resistant population, which is shown on top, which had the 400 enriched barcodes, with crinsotinib, we saw a significant reduction of the barcode complexity from more than 400 barcodes down to only five barcodes. Similarly, when instead of doing a sequential treatment, when we did an upfront combination with allotinib and crisotinib, again, the, the barcode complexity was significantly reduced from 400 down to only five barcodes. Of course, we were curious, what, what, what are these five barcodes? And it was very striking that the five barcodes were identical in the sequential and upfront combination treatment. 
And also interestingly, those were not the five most enriched barcodes after a lot of single agent treatment. So which supports the notion that depending on different drug treatment pressures, as Alice also uh, nicely illustrated this morning, it can really have a, a strong effect on the subclonal distribution of resistant clones. So this experiment suggested that the large majority of resistant clones is driven by metamplication because they can be eradicated by crisotinib treatment. And I don't have the time to show you the data, but we confirmed that indeed there was a metamplication and crisotinib treatment reduced uh, that aberrant copy number. We did a total of 14 independent replicate experiments. In every replicate experiment, the safe five barcodes were enriched. In fact, we started to get paranoid because uh, it was five barcodes out of a million. So we went to great lengths to confirm that this indeed are still HCC A27 cells by SNP profiling. We confirmed that these clones harbor still the EGFR exon 19 deletion. And we confirmed that uh, the lentiviral integration is not responsible for uh, driving resistance in these settings. So by the cell then left, so we felt very confident that these are bona fide resistant clones, and it begged the question, what is the mechanism of resistance in these dual resistant populations? Then Carrie, um, while she was carrying out the experiments and looked at the cells under the microscope, she noticed that while the majority of allotinib-treated cells exhibited an epithelial morphology, the co-treatment of crisotinib led to a significant in increase in cells with a mesenchymal phenotype. And consistent with this visual observation, when we performed gene expression profiling and compared for dual resistant to the single resistant cells, the number one upregulated pathways all involved epithelial methanchymal transition. In the RNA-seq data, we failed to identify any genetic alteration that could explain the EMT phenotype. So we currently hypothesize that non-genetic me mechanisms and likely or possibly epigenetic mechanisms are responsible for this EMT transition. In fact, Kerry observed a, a, a very significant upregulation of FGFR1 and FGF2, as well as axle gas 6 pathways in these cells, um, which have been previously been implicated in EM, driving EMT transitions. However, how these pathways are regulated, we currently don't know, and we are uh, further investigating that. But it's very much in line to what Tyler uh, just presented earlier on um, epigenetics also uh, driving resistance and heterogeneity. So just to summarize the first part of my talk, I've shown you that the majority of resistant clones in this HCCA22 models appear to be uh, pre-existing in the population. And metamplication presents the major, but not the only resistance mechanism in HCCA27 cells. The dual resistant clones have undergo AMT, and I personally wasn't surprised that the genetic resistance mechanisms were pre-existing, but I was personally actually surprised that even the EMT phenotype appears to be pre-existing rather than uh, plastic, uh, plastically acquired under the course of cancer therapy. We have just completed an in vivo experiment, and we haven't completed the analysis yet, but I think it would be really interesting to compare how uh, the barcode population compare in an in vivo experiment compared to the in vitro setting. And I'm sure Mike will talk in the next talk a lot about how the tumor microenvironment can influence um, resistance. So it would be interesting if we see a lot of overlap or differences in the in vivo setting. So now I would like to shift gears a little bit and tell you about a second story, how we applied this barcoding system to study um, resistance to able kinase inhibitors in a CML cell line model, KCL22, which harbors a pathogenomic um, uh, uh, lesion of CML, the BCR able translocation. All of you know that um, there are now highly effective able kinase inhibitors such as nilotinib and imatinib, which are approved for the treatment of the disease. And more recently, Novartis has also developed allosteric inhibitors, which target not the calytic site, but the mers binding pocket. Um, and GNF2 was a first-generation drug that was first described by Nathaniel Gray, Gray while he was at GNF. And able one is a second-generation, or, or no, like many generation uh, later molecule, which has been highly optimized and is currently in phase one clinical trials. As, as all of you know, um, the both preclinical as well as clinical studies have confirmed that a major resistance mechanism to the calytic inhibitors is the gatekeeper mutation T59. And while there's no clinical data on the allosteric inhibitors available yet, Preclinical studies by Nathaniel Gray and the Novartis labs have identified that mutations in the mers binding pocket, such as A337V, can confer resistance to these drugs. 
When we treat the KCL22 cell line model with each of those four drugs, we get very strong growth in the perturbative response, but invariably um, these cells develop resistance. It was quite uh, interesting that we repeatedly observed that resistance to allosteric inhibitors develops with slightly faster kinetics compared to the colytic inhibitors. And so we reasoned that this might either be driven by the fact that there might be more clones driving resistance to allosteric inhibitor or that they, those clones might have a higher increased proliferative capacity. And we thought that the barcoding may be able to distinguish between these possibilities. And indeed, we found that when we quantified the barcodes in the resistant population, we found that about five-fold more barcodes were enriched after treatment with the allosteric inhibitor GNF2 and ABLE01 compared to matinib and nilotinib. And in this experiment, we actually started out with three million uniquely barcoded cells. So we can do the math, and again, it shows that a very small subpopulation of the parental cells, only 0.001% in the case of catalytic inhibitors is driving um, resistance to the drug, and only slightly higher after treatment with the allosteric inhibitors. We next, or one other, one other point I should make, each dot here in, 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 in um, this graph is, illustrates independent replicate experiments, and again, you see a very consistent number of barcodes enriched with each of the drug treatments. We next wanted to investigate whether the barcodes enriched in the treatment replicates both within a drug and within different drugs are similar or different. In order to look at this, we performed an unsupervised hierarchical clustering of the 100 most enriched barcodes across all of the treatment replicates. And in this heat map, the red color indicates very high levels of barcode enrichment. The, the whitish, grayish level is a medium level of enrichment, and blue indicates no significant enrichment. So in the unsupervised clustering, we uh, immediately noticed that the, all of the imatinib and inotinib um, treatment replicates nicely cluster with each other here in the upper left and show a highly similar barcode enrichment pattern. Similarly, the replicates of treatment with the allosteric inhibitors, ABLE01 and GNF2, nicely cluster with each other and show a highly similar barcode enrichment pattern. However, the barcode pattern between the catalytic inhibitors and allosteric inhibitors was very distinct. So what this suggests is that the treatment with the same drug, like the, the replicates enriched for the same barcodes, again, strongly suggests that the drugs are selecting out pre-existing clones and that uh, the majority of resistance driven by pre-existing clones. The non-overlap between imatinib and uh, the allosteric and catalytic inhibitors in the barcode pattern suggests that they're selecting out distinct subsets of pre-existing clones, and the most parsimonious explanation for this is that the resistance is likely driven by independent molecular mechanisms. And indeed, when we performed a sequinome assay um, on the most frequently um, previously described ABLE1 sequence variants, we found that in each of the treatment replicates of the catalytic inhibitors uh, shown down here, we found evidence of T3Ni mutation, but not in the allosteric inhibitors. Conversely, in each of the allosteric inhibitor treated samples, we see a prevalent mutation of A337V, um, but not with the catalytic inhibitors. Another way to look at the barcode overlap is by this type of Venn diagram, where again we observed that we see a very strong overlap of barcode enrichment between the imatinib and nilotinib, um, the colytic inhibitors, as well as the allosteric inhibitors, um, but less so um, between the different classes. While the, the overlap, while, while the barcode pattern between the allosteric and colytic inhibitors was mostly non-overlapping, it is important to note that there was still a small but significant number of clones, 16 um, in, in this case, that actually exhibited resistance, dual resistance to both colytic and allosteric inhibitors. So we were very interested in identifying what are the molecular mechanisms that are driving these resistant patterns. So in order to do this, we isolated single clones, which allows us to determine the barcode sequences. And then in parallel, we can perform in-depth genomic analysis using RNA-seq and targeted sequencing, as well as pharmacological profiling um, with full dose response IC50s. We were able to recover readily clones that represent the different resistance classes. Clone number one and two are examples of clones that were resistant to the allosteric inhibitors, but not the catalytic inhibitors. Clone number three was an example of a clone that is resistant to the catalytic, but not the allosteric inhibitors. And clone number four was one of these dual resistant clones to both catalytic and allosteric inhibitors.
When we sequenced um, using RNC clones number one and two, we identified a heterozygous A337V mutation, which is in the Maristol binding pocket, and readily explained uh, the behavior of these clones. And indeed, um, when we performed the pharmacological profiling, we found that these clones are indeed um, now resistant to the allosteric inverted GNF2, but still sensitive to the catalytic inhibitors such as nilotinib. So this made a lot of sense. When we sequenced clone number three, we identified a heterozygous gatekeeper mutation T3i. Again, made a lot of sense. The surprise came that when we sequenced clone number four, we also identified the gatekeeper T3i mutation. But when we looked through all of our sequence data, we did not identify any additional alterations in ABLE or, or the rest of the genome that could readily explain the dual resistance to both of these drugs. So that was a bit puzzling to us. When we looked at the response of clone number three and four to nilotinib, both of them drove very strong resistance to the colitic inhibitors, as we would expect given the gatekeeper mutation. But again, a, a big surprise came when we looked at clone number three and four, the response to the allosteric inhibitor GNF2. What we saw is that uh, this T39 mutant clones, both of them were also very uh, strongly resistant to this allosteric inhibitor GNF2. So this posed the question, why do we, I told you earlier that in the GNF2 treated samples by the sequinum assay, we only detected A337V and not the T39 mutant clones. So why is this? If, if this mutation can also confer resistance to GNF2. When we look at the dose response curve in a little bit more detail as a circle here in red, if, if you look at the course closely, you can actually appreciate that there's a slight separation at the concentration of 2.5 micromolar GNF2, which was the concentration of GNF2 used in the barcoding experiment, you see a slight separation of the curves. And so to look at this in a little bit more detail, we performed a kinetic experiment where we examined the growth of these clones in the presence of 2.5 micromolar GNF2. Again, this was a concentration used in the barcoding experiment. And you can appreciate that there's a slight but reproducible increased proliferative advantage of the A337V mutant clones compared to the T39 mutant clones. And so we reasoned that maybe the slight increase in proliferative ability now leads to an expansion of the A337V mutant clones at the expense of T59. And in order to test this, we then set out to do some mathematical modeling in collaboration with Francisca Mikor at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And when we took into account the starting barcode distribution, the relative proliferative capacity of the clone, which was experimentally derived as shown here, as well as the number of population doublings, this model predicted that at the end of the experiment, we could expect, or we should expect, a ratio of A337V compared to T3I of 9 to 1. And quite remarkably, I told you in the sequinome assay we did not detect the mutations, but uh, when we did RNA-seq on the GNF2-treated samples, we actually uh, detected a ratio of A337V mutations compared to T3Ni of about 10 to 1. So this very nicely fit the model. And together this suggests that interclonal competition likely explains the enrichment of A337V over the T3Ni mutant clones in response to GNF2 treatment, as, as is graphically um, illustrated here. And it further supports the notion, again, as uh, Ellis pointed out earlier today, that under different selective um, drug treatments, um, you'll get changes in the clonal representation of tumors. Given, I've just shown you that the dual resistant clones still harbor T3-9 mutations. So the question that this raised, is there a way to completely suppress pre-existing T3-9 mutant clones so that we could uh, sword off uh, relapse to the colitic inhibitors. I've just mentioned to you that at 2.5 micromolar GNF2, the, both clones are, are strongly resistant. ABLE-01 is about 100-fold more potent than the GNF2 drug. For the, in the barcoding experiment, Kerry applied this drug at a concentration of 10 nanomolar, and she did this in order to apply the same selective pressure uh, it, on the cells during the barcoding experiment as with the GNF2 treatment. And if you look here at the curve, at 10 nanomolar ABLE-01, you see that uh, the T3-9 mutant clones um, show strong resistance to the drug. However, at higher concentrations of ABLE-01, you start to see a nice separation of the T3-9 mutant clone curves compared to the A337V mutant clone curves. And in fact, at 200 nanomolar ABLE-01, which corresponds to the TRAF level concentrations of well in vivo tolerated doses for this drug, you can see that um, 
that ABL01 is able to strongly suppress the growth of T39 mutant clones. So based on this, we hypothesize that if we increase the concentration of ABL01 to 200 nanomolars, this should now be able to suppress any pre-existing T39 mutant clones and should be able to suppress relapse to calytic inhibitors. So we set out to test this, uh, this, this notion in an in vivo experiment uh, using a KCL22 xenograft model. This model is highly sensitive to treatment with lotnib. We get very strong tumor regressions, but tumors invariably relapse. And all of the tumors harbor T39 mutations, very similar to what we observed in the in vitro setting. We can now go in with ABL01, again, get very strong anti-tumor response, but invariably tumors relapse. Now many of those tumors actually harbor dual mutations in T3i and A337V. If we, however, if we come in with an upfront combination of nilotinib and ABL01, we get very strong tumor regression and have no signs of tumor relapse. In fact, the pharmacology team, which is not shown here, took the drugs off after 80 days, and for the next 100 days, there were no tumor relapses. I think an important take-home message of this experiment is that in cases where resistance is driven by rare pre-existing clones, we really have to give drugs as upfront combinations rather than sequential treatments. And many of you know, and uh, Alice nicely illustrated earlier this morning, is that current clinical practice is that we often bait for tumors to relapse, sequence the tumors, and then give second therapy based on, the, um, on, on these newly emerged uh, mutations. However, from a cancer evolutionary perspective, I think this is, is really problematic because during relapse from the first drug, all of the cells will be resistant to the first drug and you now give the cancer the, cancer the chance to develop a secondary mutation such as here the dual mutation as we see in the xenograft model that will be dually resistant to both agents. So just to uh, summarize, I've shown you that the clone tracer barcoding system enables the study of clonal dynamics across uh, drug resistant populations. I've shown you that rare pre-existing subpopulations drive the resistance in both the HCCA27 and KCL22 cancer models. These findings together with the elegant clinical work that Charlie and others presented this morning, I think strongly suggest that what we call uh, acquired resistance in the clinic may in fact often be driven by pre-existing, the outgrowth of pre-existing clones. And I think why this is important is if this is the case, you can almost consider resistance a fait accompli before you start the treatment. And I think this probably uh, forces us to rethink the way um, we should do combination therapies in order to prevent relapse. Often we prioritize combination therapies to maximize the initial anti-tumor response, which I still think is a good idea. However, I think we also have to think about prioritizing combination therapies that have non-overlapping resistance mechanisms that target the pre-existing resistant clones to each of um, the therapies. I think we also have to be open, as Alice mentioned, to combine targeted therapies with uh, potentially more broadly acting um, um, therapies, including immunotherapies, because of the heterogeneity of resistance mechanisms that Alice described. I would actually like to point out that in each of the cell line models, and cell lines are often referred to as not being very heterogeneous, we found at least two independent pre-existing resistance mechanisms. And, and the last point would be the upfront combination, which I made on the prior slide. So with this, I would like to thank the many people who contributed to this work. Uh, again, it was uh, a very talented postdoc, Kerry Bong. Josh and Vivek did all the bioinformatics work. It was a beautiful collaboration with Francesca Miko group. Um, I didn't have the time to show all the mathematical modeling that she did to kind of support the notion that resistance pre-existing. The last little plug is that um, uh, I hope I was able to convince you that we do good basic science also at Nibber, and we currently have postdoc positions available at Novartis, including my group. So if anyone's interested, please let me know. Thank you. <laughs>